host has spent decades studying the Bible in the original languages. He holds degrees from the University of Wisconsin, Moody Bible Institute, Asbury Theological Seminary, and Bethel Theological Seminary. With the help of some of his friends, in 1994, Dr. Rako founded a national volunteer ministry to hunters. He is an author, dog trainer, and speaker. Tom served as a full-time pastor for 36 years. Now here is your host, Dr. Tom Rako. Welcome to the Rockdale Publications Quill. Uh, during today's program, we're going to continue our uh, study of what the Bible has to say about hunting. We'll be looking really at some of the ways in which suffering in our world takes place. Uh, many people have accused hunters have, of causing the unnecessary suffering of animals, but we'll see that without hunting, there can actually be an increased amount of suffering among the animal world. You will also be hearing from Dr. Mercy Sharp as she shares from my book, Devotions for Dog Lovers, about a dog that uh, saved many lives. Barry. Scripture reading, John 8, 12 through 30. Barry is credited with saving close to 20 lives. His feats of heroism were accomplished high in rugged mountains. It's truly mind-boggling to think of the premature heartaches that numerous family members were spared because of him. Indeed, Barry's rescues made a big difference, not only to those who were saved, but also in the lives of each survivor's loved ones. But the fact is, Barry didn't just venture into the dangerous Swiss Alps by chance. No, he went because he was sent, and he was sent for the purpose of saving those who were lost. You see, Barry was a St. Bernard, trained to come to the aid of travelers in distress. If you had been one of those travelers, would you have accepted Barry's help? According to the Bible, when Jesus Christ came into this world, he didn't come by chance. The Word of God tells us that God the Father sent His one and only Son into the world that we might live through Him. 1 John 4, nine. Yes, Christ came because He was sent and He came for a specific purpose. Jesus said concerning Himself, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. Luke 19.10 Have you accepted His help? Do you know someone who needs to? You can learn more about the book that tells this true story and others. For example, find out how dogs in Bible times were used to fulfill specific prophecies. Discover how some dogs with disabilities did some amazing things. Hear how a dog collected money for orphans. Learn about the first canine to be launched into outer space. Gain insight as to how God is using dogs in our world today, and much more. To order your copy of Devotions for Dog Lovers, go to the Rock Dove Publications website at www.rockdove.com. Again, to get your copy of Devotions for Dog Lovers, visit rockdove.com. We've been looking at what the Bible has to say about hunting. And, you know, many people think that if hunting were outlawed, that suffering in the animal kingdom would just simply come to a halt. The fact is, even if hunting were eventually halted, the, the suffering that takes place in the animal world would not suddenly come screeching to an abrupt halt. On the contrary, it appears that without 
hunting management, at least some forms of animal suffering could actually be intensified and greatly multiplied. This seems especially so when a person begins to get an idea of just how much wildlife ends up mangled on the bumpers and grills of our modern automobiles. Indeed, many of the blood-stained roads we travel in the fall should serve as a visible reminder that some of the greatest kinds of animal suffering take place on or alongside our highways. In fact, as Wall Street Journal reporter James P. Sturba pointed out in an article titled, I'll Sprawl and Cars Create an Era of Abundant Roadkill, quote, Cars have been running over animals since Model T's began rolling off the Ford assembly line in 1908. What's new, say wildlife biologists, is the scope of today's carnage. With an increase in driving, ever more sprawl, a decline in hunting, and the comeback of once diminished species of large animals, reported animal vehicle collisions have exploded to unprecedented levels. Unquote. Take the state of Wisconsin as a prime example. According to a past issue of Deer Hunter's Almanac, about, quote, 40,000 deer are killed each year on Wisconsin highways. That total is higher than the individual combined bow and gun harvest recorded in Connecticut, Idaho, Kansas, Maine, Massachusetts, Nebraska, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, South Dakota, Vermont, Washington, and Wyoming, unquote. Of course, in many cases, some reported and many not, the deer is crippled or left to crawl off into a ditch or a nearby cornfield and suffer a slow, agonizing death. Furthermore, car deer collisions aren't just confined to rural roads and remotely located interstate highways. Currently, some metro areas are recording the highest number of car deer accidents. Such accidents may result in serious human injury and in some cases, even the death of a driver or passenger. The late veteran deer hunter Charles Alzheimer witnessed a gory crash involving two vehicles which not only cut a whitetail buck in half, but also claimed the life of one of the drivers. He wrote in Deer and Deer Hunting Magazine, quote, The memory of what I saw will stay with me forever. The car's white leather interior looked like someone had sprayed it with red paint. A middle-aged woman lay unconscious in the passenger seat. At first I thought she was dead, but then noticed she was breathing. However, she later died from a crushed chest and internal injuries. Stunned, I remained at the scene for almost an hour before continuing the drive home. Although this occurred 37 years ago, It seems like only yesterday, unquote. On a page that offers ways to avoid car deer collisions, the Insurance Information Institute website states, quote, The explosion in the deer population has led to a continuing increase in deer car collisions. This trend will only increase as the deer population grows and urban habitats continue to encroach upon rural environments, unquote. I want to share with you a true incident that took place, a car deer collision that took place a number of decades ago, but still just sticks in my mind. I was traveling a busy state highway in Wisconsin. I came around a corner where I saw a car pulled to the side of the road and a large white-tailed doe laying on the blacktop. She was in the lane of traffic, propped up on her chest. Cars and trucks were zipping by at a high rate of speed. Her once graceful-looking forelegs were now broken with bone splintered and protruding every which way out of her hide. The doe seemed dazed as she held her head up and looked around. It was truly a pathetic scene. I stopped and had barely gotten out of my car when the driver who had hit the deer hollered out the window, Please put it out of its misery. She then said, I can't stand to watch and quickly drove away. Now, I want to ask you, what would you have done? I was neither planning, prepared, nor desiring to be placed in such a situation. I was dressed in my good clothes and had nothing appropriate along with which to end the deer's suffering. I suppose I might have somehow rationalized away my personal responsibility towards this beautiful creature. After all, I wasn't the one who hit the deer. Why did I have to take responsibility of the situation? Perhaps... I could have told myself, I just don't have the heart to kill such a beautiful animal or 
she will probably die in a few minutes anyway, so why not just leave her? And even though it was a dangerous part of the road and the traffic was cruising along at a high rate of speed, I could have conveniently concluded certainly a law enforcement officer or some other driver will eventually remove her from the path of traffic so no one will wind up getting in an accident. Now, I'm certainly no hero and I didn't want to do this. But, you know, in some states, law enforcement officers must be the person to put such a suffering animal out of its misery. According to the Department of Natural Resources website for the state of Illinois, quote, except for any law enforcement officers in the performance of their duties, it shall be illegal to kill a deer crippled by collision with a motor vehicle, unquote. This is unfortunate and, in my estimation, could in some cases, in fact, in many cases, prove to be a cruel and immoral law. Especially if a person hits a deer and that deer is allowed to suffer needlessly for a prolonged period of time due to the isolated location of the collision or the lack of an available officer in some rural areas. Without a doubt, in many instances, deer are going to suffer longer than they would have really needed to suffer. Nevertheless, in this case, and again, I was certainly no hero, I couldn't just let her lie there and suffer. So as sickening as it was to me, and probably sounds to you, I pulled a tire iron out of my car trunk and walked up behind the animal. Unfortunately, it took me several brutal blows to end her life. My dress pants and shirts were spattered with blood as I dragged the dead deer carcass off the lane of traffic over to the shoulder of the road. Although this was a gruesome incident, I include it because it's reality. In fact, let me just say that over 50 years, I have been involved in harvesting deer with bow and rifle, and yet this car deer episode on the highway clearly stands out as one of the most grotesque. Indeed, uh, this incident of highway suffering stands out in sharp contrast to the degree of suffering I have ever observed in the woods during hunting season. But just how often do deer hit by a car suffer in a ditch or a roadside cornfield? Of course, only God knows for sure. But regardless of precisely how many hundreds of thousands of times similar situations occur on our on an annual basis, the truth remains that car deer collisions can certainly be a horrible and heart-wrenching experience. You know, apart from the serious human aspect of suffering, the pain associated with car-deer collisions doesn't always end with the visible death or injury of the deer, which is directly involved in the accident. It is important to remember that when an adult doe carcass is observed rotting in the road in the spring or early summer, This usually means that there is a dead fawn or two, and sometimes even three, decaying unseen in a nearby woods or patch of weeds. Of course, the deaths of these little deer entail a significant degree of suffering as they are left to languish with no mother to nurse them. On the other hand, when a deer herd is kept in check by fall hunting, the herd is not only healthier overall, but normally there are fewer car deer collisions. Indeed, contrary to what some might want the public to believe, a car or truck is neither a painless or efficient way to control deer populations. However, it is frequently one of the most brutal and wasteful. Furthermore, the number of deer killed by vehicles is quite significant. In some states, 100,000 deer are killed. Roadkill removal is also an extensive and expensive enterprise and sometimes results in additional roadkill. Often carcass removal is contracted out. Again, as Wall Street reporter James P. Sturba points out, quote, many road crews simply pull roadkill off the highways into the weeds, perhaps adding lime and let nature take its course. Vultures, coyotes, possums, and other scavengers come along and often become roadkill themselves, unquote. Sadly, it seems that some animal rights activists would much rather see a deer rot in the ditch or observe it being pulverized on the highway than to think of some family being fed venison which has been brought home through hunting. I can't help but come to the conclusion that such an attitude is actually anti-human. Many animal rights activists have grown up in homes and neighborhoods where neither they nor their friends lacked material goods. 
As a result, they sometimes fail to have even the slightest inkling as to what wild game can mean to a hungry family. Yes, there are currently people who experience hunger in our world and even in our own country. In fact, Rick Wilson, who is the founder of Farmers and Hunters Feeding the Hungry, had his eyes opened wide to this reality through an experience he encountered on the road. Farmers and Hunters Feeding the Hungry is a unique organization that helps provide literally tons and tons of venison for the hungry and impoverished in our land. Rick related the providential and heart-wrenching incident which eventually led him to found this extremely practical ministry. Quote, For I was hungry, and you gave me meat. Matthew twenty-five thirty-five. I was driving down the Virginia Highway in late September a few years ago to meet with some friends. We were planning to clear a little brush at the farm where we hunt and celebrate the landowner's birthday with a barbecue. About five miles before turning down the gravel farm lane, I spotted a woman standing by her car with the trunk open. I was a little late and tempted not to stop. I'm glad I did. From her dress and the appearance of her old car of many colors, it was obvious she was not doing well. When I asked if her car was broken, she said, No, could you please help me over here besides these bushes? What was waiting for me over beside those bushes? Hesitantly, I followed until I spotted a fat but slightly battered six-point buck beside those bushes. She slowly asked, Could you please help me put it in my trunk? When I asked if she had hit it with her car, she said, No. Next, I explained that unless she reported the deer to the state police or a wildlife officer, she could be issued a citation for transporting an untagged deer. She looked into my eyes and slowly answered, I don't care. My kids and me are hungry. Too much talk and too little action. We loaded the deer into her trunk. As she closed the lid of her trunk, I asked one last question. Would you like me to field dress it for you? Her reply answered all. No, since my husband left, me and my kids are getting good at it at home, and they don't bleed all over the trunk anymore. Standing there as she drove away, I knew I just looked into the eyes of Jesus. Unquote. Unfortunately, some folks who live in safe, theoretical, upper-middle-class bubbles or who hold a tenured position in some Ivy League school or seminary supported by denomination seem willingly ignorant of such kinds of human suffering. And the fact is, the limitations of habitat are also a reminder that animals suffer, not only the highways, but also the fact that habitat is limited as far as to how much game it can support. It remains a reality that even without humans hunting, the death of animals and birds will continue to take place. Besides the numerous car-deer collisions taking place and the direct consequences of the fall that helped spawn the brutality that exists in nature, there are other reasons as well. Simply put, animals and birds will continue to experience death because wildlife habitat simply has its limitations. As the biggest and best pie can only be cut so many times to feed so many people, so also the best wildlife habitat can only sustain a certain amount of wildlife. As ecologist Raymond F. Dasman explained in a book titled Environmental Conservation, quote, every habitat for wildlife as well as for domestic livestock has its carrying capacity, which sets firm limits on population increase. No wild animal population can be maintained permanently at a level above the carrying capacity, which is determined by the available food, cover, water, and other essentials for life. Yet each year, a population at carrying capacity will produce young. This crop of young will represent, therefore, an excess above what the environment can support. Either the young must perish or older animals must die to make a place for them. The annual crop of young, therefore, represents a surplus number of animals which cannot be maintained by the environment. This surplus each year may safely be harvested by man without in any way decreasing the number of animals that the environment will maintain. 
If man does not harvest it, natural causes will bring about the reduction, unquote. In the same manner that the most filled refrigerator or cupboards have limitations as to how many people can be fed from them, so also only a limited amount of wildlife can be fed from even the most productive parcels of habitat. Hunting, if regulated appropriately, can be one of the best forms of stewardship and management. It should also be pointed out that if wildlife is not kept in proper check, severe consequences can result. Those who think that hunting should be banned often fail to realize ways in which uncontrolled wildlife populations can affect the environment and the future of a wildlife population itself. Diseases can spread and decimate herds or flocks which have been overpopulated. Vegetation can be destroyed and predators can begin wreaking havoc on nesting areas, including those of threatened or endangered species. Indeed, predators are not prejudiced in that they will eat the offspring of threatened species as well as any other. Furthermore, agricultural crops that individual landowners and local rural economies are dependent upon can also suffer severe damage. Most people don't realize how quickly a crop can be damaged or even totally destroyed by a large concentration of wildlife. I didn't know, despite having grown up on a dairy farm and having spent many years involved with agriculture. I didn't realize until a vegetable canning company that I worked for as a field supervisor had problems with raccoons. I watched as a large field of sweet corn located next to a state park in Wisconsin, where no hunting is allowed, was decimated in just a few short nights. The raccoon population certainly must have been enormous and raccoons seem to know when sweet corn is ready. Perhaps worst of all, they destroyed as much or even more than they ate. They often go through a field, climb a stalk until it bends over or breaks. Then after they take a bite or two out of the middle of an ear, they go on to another nearby corn stalk. In this particular case, the Department of Natural Resources was contacted and quickly installed towers with horns that would blast at about every half hour after dark. This seemed to work one night, but the raccoon quickly became conditioned and then ignored the noisy horns. The company I worked for had no other choice than to harvest the crop prematurely before the crop was entirely lost. Those who choose to live a vegetarian lifestyle because they think the killing of animals is wrong would probably find it more difficult to obtain food in this country if wildlife populations were not kept in control by the hunting community. I'm reminded of the way the Lord told the Hebrews that he would drive out before them those who possess the land of Canaan. He then explained how he would do this and why he would not give the children of Israel the land all at once. He told the Israelites, quote, But I will not drive them out in a single year because the land would become desolate and the wild animals too numerous for you. Little by little I will drive them out before you until you have increased enough to take possession of the land. Unquote. Exodus chapter 22, verses 29 to 30. See also Deuteronomy 7, verse 22. The Lord wanted to maintain a proper balance between the wildlife that inhabited the land and its chosen people who soon would be living there. The fact is, God is for wildlife. We find in the same chapter of Exodus where God expresses concern that the wild animals would become too numerous, that the Lord also made provision for wild animals and the harvesting procedures that the Hebrews were to follow. They were instructed, for six years you are to sow your fields and harvest the crops, but during the seventh year let the land lie unplowed and unused. Then the poor among your people may get food from it, and the wild animals may eat what they leave. Do the same with your vineyard and your olive grove. Exodus 23, verses 10 to 11. The same type of provision for wild animals can also be found in Leviticus 25, verses 6 to 7. Certainly the Lord was concerned about the wild creatures that inhabit our woods and fields thousands of years before any animal rights or environmental group cared. And uh, when we come back, we'll be making some closing remarks as we've looked at how highways remind us that animals suffer and habitat is limited. 
And of course, if populations, wildlife populations are not kept in control, there can be things like distemper, mange, blue tongue, all kinds of things, uh, chronic wasting disease that will reduce, reduce those numbers. And we are called to be stewards and managers of what God has given us and created uh, for his glory, ultimately. When we come back, we'll have some closing remarks. What does the Bible have to say about hunting? In Hunting in the Bible, a scripture safari by Dr. Tom Rako, find out how people hunted in Bible times. Learn about the existence of ancient hunting lists. Acquire a knowledge of the scriptures with regards to God's concern for both animals and birds. Discover specific hunting regulations found in the Old Testament. Gain insight into what the scriptures have to say concerning modern-day hunting practices and much more. This book will help you to become an expert in knowing what the Bible has to say about hunting. To order your copy of Hunting in the Bible, a scripture safari, go to the RockGov Publications website, rockgov.com. Visit rockgov.com today. Well, we looked at how highways remind us that animals suffer and that habitat is limited. Habitat can sustain only a certain amount of wildlife. And it seems to me that wildlife surpluses should be harvested and used with a great degree of gratitude to God. And uh, how can needlessly allowing the carcass of a creature to rot alongside a busy highway? Next time you see a, a dead deer laying along the highway, think about this. How can that uh, glorify God. Wouldn't it be better to use such surpluses from these renewable resources to feed or clothe people? Of course, wildlife habitat has also been purchased or set aside, and wildlife management practices have been supported through conservation groups or the license revenues that hunters pay. And although animal rights activists don't like to make mention of it, over the years, it has been the hunting community that has primarily funded endeavors to help wildlife, and we have a responsibility to do that. And uh, I thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we'll be starting a new study next time, and uh, hope that you will join us again on the Rock Dove Publications Quill. been listening to the Rock Dove Publications podcast with your host, Dr. Tom Rako. This program has also been brought to you by the Quilted Arrow, home of intelligent, stylish, field-bred English pointers with bloodline streams from Hall of Fame champion Guardrail. Thank you so much for listening. Now this is Beth Rako inviting you to join us again next time on the Rock Dove Publications podcast. <music>